All of you, I'm Justin. I'm from the Philippines, and I'm here today to talk about the future of work, specifically that it's project-based and that we should hurry up and embrace it. So, my first question to all of you is: If you had a business, or if you have a business, how would you hire a graphic designer tomorrow? I would think of a bunch of criteria, mainly four, and these are the four criteria I would center it on. First is frequency. How often do I need to have a graphic designer? After all, this is a new business. Do I have the money to hire one full time? Or do I need one on a case to case basis? Second, what's the level of skill that I would want that graphic designer to be? Do I want someone who can make simple graphics or something very complex? A whole branding, like GIFs, videos? Is that what I'm asking for? Third, what are the responsibilities that I want this graphic designer to have? Is it something that they have to be on call 24-7? Or is it something that I can contract them for a short period of time? And then the last is, what help do they need from me? How much is the salary they're hoping to get from this? Do I have to cover the tools, or do they already have it? What other resources do they need to make the project happen? So to to bring it a little closer to home, I actually did start a business last month back in the Philippines. So I started a leather handmade shoes for men's brand. And we decided we wanted a different branding from most men's shoes. So it's usually classical, minimalist, just one letter for their logo. But for us, we wanted to make something a lot more different. So our logo is actually a squid. So for those of you who might know, the Leviathan is something in the Bible. It's a monster. And that was the vibe we were going for for our shoes. So when we decided to start this business, we had no money to hire a full-time graphic designer. And so we made the decision that we're going to hire a one-time contractor to make branding and templates that we could use. We didn't want someone that we had to call all the time. And we wanted to make sure everything was as simple as possible so that we only had to pay them once to do this. So let's back up a little bit as well and share a um, little more about me. So I'm Justin. Like I said, I'm 24 years old, and I'm from Manila, Philippines. I'm ethnically Chinese, but what a Chongwen Hun Puhao. So I have to speak in English. So I back home, I work for Unilever as an operations manager for their brand. So if you know the brand Dove Shampoo, we are the makers of that, and I handle one of their other brands back home. In my spare time since college, I've been running a blog called The Bumpy Career. It's a blog that helps Filipino college students learn about interning and job hunting from a first-hand experience, because nobody was writing about that back home. And in my spare time, I started a new thing, Leviathan Shoes, which is our shoe brand, because I got sick recently, and I had to take a few months off work. So going back to the question that I asked you, what would you like, who would you hire? For me, it boils down to three different kinds of people you could hire. Number one, an amateur, someone who knows the basics of everything you need and is for sure cheap. Second is someone who is an expert, someone who knows exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it. But for sure, it will be expensive, but it will be done fast. And the last is someone who is a lateral expert. So a lateral expert is someone who knows something similar to it, but hasn't done that exact thing yet. So you would be the first of that type of project, but you know they can do something same. So for me, I ended up hiring a lateral expert. We hired a small branding agency that was two people, and their specialty was making branding for food stalls. And we were their first ready-to-wear client. And it worked for us because we knew exactly what we were doing. We had that right amount of budget to hire a one-time contractor for this one-time kind of work. But we also structured the work that way that it was a one-time thing. We didn't need to continually contract their services. And that's a theme that we're seeing a lot more nowadays. So everyone knows the circle, the good, fast, cheap. There is nothing that exists 
and all three, correct? But it seems to be changing nowadays. We're realizing that there is a way to get things good, fast, and cheap, but it requires automation, tools, AI, rise of abilities, in, and also in the rise in knowledge of the people that we're working with. So let's jump to something else, completely different for a moment. So I went to a small private Catholic university in the Philippines, and this is my course, Communications Technology Management. It's roughly marketing. So when we graduate, there's about 200 of us from that course, uh, we all become one of these four things. And we join an ad agency, we become brand managers, event organizers, or social media managers. It's very hard for us to break out of that, but it's very easy for us to be hired for that. Why? because we are specialized for it. That's what our training is for. That's what school taught us to be. By the time we graduate, we already know how to run events. We already know what an ad agency is like because most of us have done internships in it. Most of us were funneled towards it. But I ended up doing something quite different. I ended up becoming an IT project manager at first before becoming a brand manager. And the reason I was able to do that was because I had done something different from the rest. I had gone out and started training myself for those skills. I didn't wait for the school to teach me those things. I didn't follow everyone else. And that's the main point of us being at this talk. We need to start realizing that if we want to do something outside of what we're being trained for at school or at our current work right, you know, right now, we have to either find an employer willing to train us from scratch at their own cost, or we need to start training ourselves in our free time, even if we have no free time. Because that's something that is so common nowadays. Even though we have all of these tools to make our lives easier, we don't have as much free time as our parents or as our grandparents. So I want you to think about it for a second. What would you prefer doing if you, as an employee? What would you prefer doing if you were a company? Would you want to hire someone that you have to train from scratch? Or would you rather hire someone who's already trained themselves to learn those skills? For me, it's quite obvious that companies would want to hire those seasoned experts, but they want to hire them at the prices for amateurs. They want to save money, of course. So they will offer us the lowest possible salary. They will offer us the least amount of money possible to get the most amount of work done from us. But if we really push at it, if we're the best, if we are able to provide a unique service that no one else can, then they'll take on that season expert as is, but maybe they won't take them on long term like we did with the branding agency. Maybe they'll take them on for short term, only when they need to. So I'm hinting at something that's already changing in our workplace. Nowadays, more people are getting hired as gig contractors, project-based contractors, people who come in for a short period of time to do a sh extremely specified amount of work and then they leave. But sometimes it's a full-time member of the company who is being trained to only do this one specific thing. So back in Unilever, we have people who are specialized in marketing intelligence, meaning they only come at the very start of any brand campaign planning. They're the ones who come up with the insights, they're the ones who share all of the user feedback, and then as soon as they're done, they go to the next brand, they go to the next project. And that's what we're seeing nowadays, here in the shift for that kind of workplace setup. So I wanna highlight three points mainly before we get to what we can do about it. So this is a quote from McKinsey. It roughly says that, that workplaces are demanding higher level skills from us, creative skills, cognitive skills, critical thinking skills. They don't need someone who can do clerical work. They don't need someone who is good at copy pasting or filing all the documents. They need someone who can solve problems for them. And it's going to grow as much as 90% between 2016 to 2030. So first point, work 
and workers are becoming very specialized. Before, in the Industrial Revolution, to even up to the 1990s or early 2000s, we were all just cogs in the machine, meaning we can be easily changed. We're doing repetitive work day in, day out. And it's not, you don't have to be extremely skilled to get started at it, but it is time consuming work. But nowadays we're seeing that there's a rise in automation, AI, tools that help us do that low scale repetitive work quickly at less head count, meaning people who do those jobs are going to have to learn how to do something else soon. And now we see that high scale work is what's coming, what companies are asking from us. They want us to collaborate, to create things, to understand problems and solve them at the root of it. Do things that robots can't do yet. So it's up to us to be learning new skills and combining them to become unique skilled workers. Like how graphic designers can shift to become UX designers, how project managers are shifting to becoming product managers. We're seeing that slow but, su slow but steady shift. So for the second point, it's that stints with companies are getting shorter and shorter because of our changing needs. So I was born in 1995, which means I'm part of the new generation, Gen Z. So there's millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. In a study, there it said that millennials would only leave their job if one, their salary wasn't being raised consistently year on year, and two, their career development wishes weren't being met, meaning they weren't getting promoted, they weren't getting the assignments they wanted. But they all said the same thing. For them, a right amount of time in a job is three to five years. That's how long before they start thinking, maybe I need to move on. For Gen Z though, it's quite different. They said that they'd leave a job if their learning development skills aren't being met, if their flexibility wishes, like work from home, or no need to be in the office needs aren't being met. For them, salary is a lot less because they're used to the idea of having a second gig, a side hustle, like me, having a blog and also a shoe business when I already have a job. And for them, 18 months to three years is what they consider a long time in a job. Think about that. Half the time of what a millennial thinks a long time in a job is, is what a Gen Z thinks a long time in a job is. And then the last point is that flexible workplaces are what's in right now, what everyone is asking for from their employers. So before you had to be in an office from nine to six, but you clearly had a work-life balance. As soon as you left the office, work ended for you. You didn't have to do anything. But now, it's quite different. They expect you to be online all the time. We have WhatsApp, Viber, messaging apps to always ping us and ask us, where is the proposal? Where is the project? Where are we now? It's expected that work and life are now integrated. They're not a balance. You have to merge them into one. And most importantly, it's expected from Gen Z that they start using tools to automate and redundate me like low skill tasks in their lives. They need more freedom, more time, more ability to do whatever it is that they want to. And workplaces are starting to change, but I don't think that they're moving fast enough for that as well. Because how many workplaces offer you a more than one day work from home option? How many even offer a work from home option? In the Philippines, it's very rare. So for us, we have to commute about four hours to cross 10 kilometers to get to work because we don't have trains or buses. We all have to take cars to get there. So that's why you see a lot more Filipinos moving to entrepreneurship or to working for abroad entities from their home because that's where they're getting this kind of flexibility from. So now let's shift to tying all of this together. What do you need to know to become that in-demand seasoned expert employee ASAP? If that means that you stay in the company or if that means that you leave the company and start your own sort of subletting outsourcing company, that's up to you. But the main things you need to know first, if you remain as an employee, 
is that you need to plan and rewrite your job description. You can't just let them dictate everything towards you anymore. Because if you do so, you can easily fall behind in terms of your skills and your learning. You'll just be making money for them, but maybe someday you'll be the one who's not updated anymore, who they're going to read on date. And that's a scary, scary future. So the three main points you need to do is number one, set up your own learning plan. You need to know what you want to learn. What projects do you want to take? What skills do you want to pick up? And you need to share that to your manager. You need to share that to HR. You need to make it very clear and upfront. You need to be annoying about it because nobody is going to make those decisions or stand up for you. The second is that you need to start a continuous feedback loop. What does that mean? It means asking your managers, asking your project leads, asking your teammates for feedback on what you can improve on. But it's not just asking every single person. You need to be very specific on what you're asking from them because some people might just be giving you negative feedback because they're jealous or they're angry at you. You need to go to someone who is an expert in that skill in your organization and you need to be asking for that kind of feedback from them. How do I improve in presentation? How do I improve in my analysis? H what do I need to specifically do? You need actionable steps. So don't settle for, ah, you're doing well, because that's not going to help you at all. Be upfront about it, but also be willing to give that kind of upfront feedback back to them, because we need to start building these continuous feedback loops ourselves. And then the last one is to cultivate your interests, even the ones outside of work. Why? Because 65% of children now entering primary school will hold jobs that currently don't exist. There are fields that haven't even started yet. Like, do you know what's happening in the fields of music and AI? I don't, but maybe someone who is an expert violinist and data scientist does. He's the one who's pioneering that field, and so on. So you can't just become a one, speciali one topic specialist. You need to be a deep generalist. You, know, you need to know two to five topics fairly well so that you can find what's inside, uh, what's in between them, and what's the potential for you to grow, to find your niche, your future job that you've created yourself. And then as an individual, what can you do today to prepare for all this? It's mainly to embrace ultra learning. So you can Google it. It's an actual term now coined by Harvard Business School on how you can learn something extremely difficult in less than three months. So one of their case studies was learning Chinese in eight months. And I absolutely don't believe it because Chinese is so difficult to learn. But they are saying, we can do it. So maybe someday I'll try so that I don't you know, come up here and speak in English instead of Chinese. So the main ways to do ultra-learning is these three. First, you need to research whatever it is that you want to learn and focus on what specific part of it. So let's say I want to learn how to do branding for my own shoes. Do I have to learn everything about graphic design or do I need to learn more about like design elements, colors, working with a specific tool? How do I go in the simplest possible path to learn as much as I can to get to that end goal as fast as I can. The second is to interview informational experts. So these aren't people who are at the top of their fields. These are people who are just a year or two ahead of you, who maybe even a few months ahead of you, because they're the ones who know how to learn it from scratch. They're the ones who can tell you, this is the guide that you should follow. This is the guides you don't need to follow. You need to learn this. You need to listen to that. You need to come here. You need to speak to them. They're the ones who can help you the best because they understand you the best because they were you just a year or two ago. And then the last one is to start simulating projects or even start a project yourself. That means finding an existing product, uh, project for you to recreate. So one project I saw while searching, while creating this, slides was that in Australia, there are open source AI projects on understanding their weather patterns to better understand irrigation for their farms there. So what if someone just recreates that with Taiwanese weather data sets, with Philippine weather data sets? 
So you don't have to start something from scratch. You already have a model, but you're making it your own and you're helping out people along the way. Which is why I really advocate that if you do start a project, you need to start on an open source project. You don't have to start it from scratch completely on your own, but it might be better for you to work on an existing one, to contribute to it, even just a line or two, even if it's just an understanding of it from your own experience. Because when you work on an open source project, you get these four main benefits. Number one, the more you see, the more you can take back as your, take as your own idea like I said, with the Australian weather patterns. The second is that this is a chance for you to collaborate with experts in your field. You don't have to reach out to them and say, oh, I want to apprentice under you, I want to be your assistant. You can just follow their paths on these open source projects and work on what they've worked on as well. And maybe if you fix something that they fixed as well, they'll reach out to you back. So stories like this are very common in uh, American GitHub, where someone fixes a line or two in the repository and they are reached out to by the owner of the project who happens to work for Google or Yahoo and says, would you like to come and try out for an interview here? So it really opens up their career paths simply because they're helping out in that community, which leads to the third and fourth point. Open source means that you can work on ideas that might never have occurred to you on of your own free will. There are ideas about cooking out there or about improving the world for blind people, which I might become one day because of my glasses. So it helps you understand that there's a million ways you can help thousands of people who are gonna thrive on your idea, which is the last point. And knowing all of that, I hope that you come out of this talk thinking that what do I want to start doing tomorrow or next week to start preparing for myself one or two years from now? It doesn't have to be a complete shift. It can be something as simple as picking up a new skill, reading a new article, or starting on a project just a few hours a week. So thank you for listening to my talk. And now it's time for Q&A, if you have any questions, of course.